So a couple of things I want to do. I want to, uh, I, I don't need to give away this book because you already have it. And so this is the one uh, that we have called, I have called Str Strategic Real Estate Investing. And this is the how-tos. So this book, uh, the publisher, which is a Christian publisher, Harrison Wealth, asked me to write this just aimed at real estate and not, not to uh, uh, do any preaching or anything in this one. All my other books are full of scripture. But they asked me to use this more as an evangelistic tool so people can write in and we can follow up with them. But this, this is full of the how-tos to create passive income through real estate mastery, through real estate investing. And uh, so I give you some of my journey and I give you some formulas in here on how you learn how to invest and make sure that you stay out of trouble. Is there anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Man, I'm telling you, boy, you guys, you guys are quick. Okay, so do I have anybody? Now, where, where are you from? Uganda, here we go. If you're from Uganda and you're here, you get to have it. There you go. And uh, we, we also have um, a real estate workshop. Now, listen, what I'm gonna tell you right now is not a sales job. There are, uh, we, we limit the workshop to 100 in-person people, if any of you ever been to one. How many of you ever been to one of the workshops? Okay, so you know, so we limit it to 100. I think they told me last night we're at 96 in person and I don't know, like 200 live stream. But in person, you can get 50% off. And I think, seriously now, I think it's limited to the first 10 people. And let me tell you why I told you we had 96 and we limit it to 100. Those are sold tickets. That's people have already paid, okay, to come. And uh, they don't have the price up there. Huh? No, it says 50% off in-person ticket use code conference and you go to wealthbuilders.org, wealthbuilders.org front slash events. I forgot to tell them, was it Wealth Builders? For you, it was wealthbuilders.net front slash invest for the other stuff. This is wealthbuilders.org front slash events. Boy, I apologize. I don't know what it is. Anyway, it's 50% off. And the reason, the reason I can tell 10, the first 10 here get it is because even though we sell the tickets, people don't show up. Tickets are sold and these tickets, the regular price is $997, just so you know. So when I say we've sold 96 tickets and we limit it to 100, some of those who pay don't show up and they just revert over to live stream, but the majority, these are all in person. How much is it? It's 697, is that what it is at the rate? So is that the price or is it 50% off 697? It's 50% off 697. It's fit, really? I don't think we've ever done that. Anyway, it's 50% off of 697. So that's a workshop, huh? 300 for the live stream, 299 or something. So anyway, that, that go, we, we do 28, I think it's 28 sessions in the real estate workshop and it's all how to's. So if you come, it's going to be April the 28th through the 30th. We'll make that available to you. If you can't come, we have the book I just gave away. Plus, this is my specialty real estate mastery series where I really give you some secret sauce inside of what we do. And this one is, uh, is loaded. This particular, see, for example, I even teach you on here how to become a true real estate professional and get unlimited write-offs on your taxes. We teach you how to do that. We show you how to identify properties, whether they're single family homes, duplexes or quads, or if you want to get into commercial stuff. We talk about all kinds of things in there. If you're really interested, if you're not interested, don't worry about this one. But if you're really interested in real estate, this, this is a A to Z how-to uh, in this particular program. And I think here they said it's a, it's a thousand bucks, okay? I tell you what, if you go back there, I'll give it to you for, you know who made these slides, Caleb? I don't either. I don't like that price. You think since I own it, can I change the price? Okay, don't tell them I did that. Okay, if you go back there, I'll sell you that whole product for $7.97. And that's not a gimmick. I really didn't know the price. That's the truth. I don't like the price. So, And then this is Money Mastery. 
And this is, you get a workbook, my, the book I gave away a while ago, plus my teaching. I believe these are videos. And you get videos of us teaching on Money Mastery and that whole program is only $197. So, I mean, y'all okay with that? All right. The last thing I want to mention to you is, uh, as I teach on what's coming up in the quarter, is Tricord Global. Right now, this is a company I use for microfinance. Do you guys in the booth, where, where am I, who am I looking at? Do we, do we have the video, the Tricord video to play of Farm Uganda? You have that one? Yeah, this is only a two minute video. Let me just show this to you. The student, before you play it, the student that's coming up on here, the Samuel, which you'll see the words on the bottom because he's from Uganda. Uh, uh, he graduated from third year business school. The person on this, on this video, and I want you to see it because this is things, we have a bank and some microfinance uh, companies that we operate in Uganda. We also have been in Malawi, we've been in Bogota, Colombia. But this shows you what we do. And this is third X stuff. This is the stuff the Lord showed me how to do when I began to move over to the third X. So here's the video that shows you one of the things that we're doing in Tricor Global. So can you show that? Are we ready for that? Hello, welcome to the Farm Uganda. My name is Samuel. The Farm Uganda Limited is a community-based farm. We do crop production and animal husbandry. We also do contract farming. We have goats and chicken, maize, beans, and matoke, what you call bananas. We also do plow and plant for smallholder and medium-scale farmers, mainly maize and beans in rural Murende. The Farm Uganda Limited employs 11 permanent staff, the tractor operators, the farm manager and his team, and we also employ over 20 seasonal workers. These ones help us with weeding and harvesting. They are mainly the youth and the women in the neighborhood of our farm, which is located in Kasanda in rural Mubende. In the past three years, the Farm Uganda has, has done a number of things, including a construction of a humble farmhouse that gives our workers a decent shelter. We have also introduced goats and chicken, and we are currently drilling a water well, which is being manually dug, and we are at 60 feet at the moment. This well will not only serve the farm Uganda, but also the community. Where we live, where the farm is, the closest water source that is hygienic is as far as six miles. We also promote the gospel through partnering with churches in the community. We at the farm are promoting Andrew Mark Discipleship Program and we are trying to work with the community to see how we can spread it further beyond the farm. Thank you Tricode Global, thank you partners to Tricode Global. Thank you, friends and family of Farm Uganda. We love you. Please look up the Farm Uganda Limited for more. Thank you. So Samuel graduated from the business school here in at Karis, and uh, he competed with 93 other, 93,000 other applicants in a program to submit his business uh, in Africa. A billionaire in Africa sponsored it and Samuel won it with the business plan that he submitted for Farm Uganda out of 93,000 contestants. It was a phenomenal thing that happened. And what we did, what, th this is only one small example of what Tricor does but we did a $100,000 loan, like a microfinance loan, through a bank that we have there in Uganda called Glotrans, and we did it through the bank, and uh, we also bought and purchased for free. We donated, uh, we donated a tractor, a big tractor, a big brand new farm tractor, trailer, and some implements that we donated, plus a vehicle, some other things, and today that farm is very prosperous and God is blessing it. 
We have many clients like that around Uganda. And so what the Lord showed me how to do since I'm teaching all, all this was how to take what I call transactional money and make a transformational difference. So Tricor Global now has been going since 2000. It's actually started in 2008. Uh, we've been doing loans overseas in either Vietnam, uh, Colombia, over in Africa right now, primarily in Uganda. And uh, we've been doing it now since 2008. And this is 2023. And the minimum investment we have is a $20,000 cash investment. It's a, uh, our, with an IRA, it's 25,000. You can invest from an IRA. And the minimum is 25. You can invest cash or with an IRA. And then you can also contribute additional funds if you want to. The median investment in Tricord Global is $100,000. What that means is if 10 people walk through the back door and they say, I want to invest in Tricord, then the typical seven out of 10 of those would be a $100,000 investment. Most of you would think it'd be a 20 or 25,000, but the majority of investments by far are a hundred grand. We have uh, several uh, that are much, much, much larger than that. So I started Tricord Global in 2008 with a, and I'm telling you that this is how we did it. I started it with a million dollar donation from my stuff on the third X. And so what I did was I put a million dollars in the beginning in Tricord Global to run the operations and do the things. And since then, it has become uh, quite a, a larger organization that's really having a great impact. And so what we do is, is we make small loans to large loans. So we'll make a loan as small as 300 US dollars. We've done them as small as 50, but right now it's about 300 is the smallest, all the way up to about $250,000 in one loan. So there's a range of loans that we do overseas uh, in through the bank. And so the biggest loan we're doing has have done and are doing now is about 250. The smallest is 300. That's out in the villages. What the reason we do that is because if you go to the central banks in these foreign countries like Uganda, now if you look it up today on Google, you'll see something like 7% or 9%, but the actual rate that the central banks loan to over there for many years, regardless of what the published number is, it's 16%. So that means that if, I, if I'm a bank and I own a bank and I go to the central bank, like we have here, we call them the Fed. And I go to the Fed to get money. The Fed, I'm gonna show you here in just a second with all these graphs I've got. The Fed was loaning money to banks here in the US up until about six months ago. It was loaning at seven, eight months ago, it was loaning at 0% interest. And then banks were doing those loans at two, three, four, five, six, seven percent Today they're a lot higher, somewhat higher, especially on what we call uh, commercial loans. But the reason I'm bringing this up is that they actually pay us back to Tricord Global when we loan money to them, to, to the banks, to the bank, they pay us back at 12%. Over here on this side, if somebody invests, you make four to 8% depending on the amount you invest and how long you invest it. And so we have five years, you can invest for five years, you can invest for seven years, or you can invest for 10 years. You can also receive quarterly payments. Remember I taught you on the second X, make sure you have either monthly, quarterly, or annual income. We pay quarterly on the money if you invest it, or you can choose to compound, it's your choice. So if you're in an IRA, a lot of people will compound and take it. So that's the way we do it. We pay four to 8% over here and we loan it out over there at 12%. And I don't want you to think that's high because even, so if you, if you are a consumer and you go to get a, a loan at somewhere like Barclays, and I'm talking about you have collateral and you know what you're doing and you have good income, they're gonna charge you 30% annual interest all day long. So the fact we're loaning at 12% is a life changer and it allows us to, I don't have to come back over here and raise donations because now the, the Tricord has enough income coming and going out that we're able to be self-perpetuating in what we do. If I didn't raise another penny, Tricord would still stay in existence because now it's self-perpetuating. Everybody with me? But if you want to participate, you can go to the back. There's a packet. Do I have the packet? Right here. So there's a pack, this is not a missions brochure. So you have to be qualified to be able to take one. They're gonna take your name, your address, not to follow up or to call you, but just so that we know who got a packet. 
All right, so this is, this is a real investment. So uh, thank you. This is Caleb, by the way. So Caleb is the one you would talk to. Thank you, Caleb. Okay, everybody okay? I had a few more commercials than I thought I had. Okay, let's, uh, let's talk about where we are in, in uh, the second quarter. I didn't get a chance to talk about bubbles. Let me see here. So this is the scripture that I started with and that I gave you last year. We're gonna give you some brand new stuff this year. It says, from the sons of Issachar, men who understood their times with knowledge of what Israel should do, the ch their chiefs were 200 and all their kinsmen were at their command. So I have in bold for you to see this, that the men who understood the times with knowledge of what Israel sh should do. And so that's what I wanna kinda do today is kind of give you an, uh, an understanding of where we are. Last year, when I, when I was up here, inflation was about right over here. And then between last year and this year, you can see where inflation has peaked. And you can see, if you look right over here, this number, can y'all see that up there? That, that, can you see it, that number? That's 8%. And so inflation peaked above 8%. And right now, as we're sitting here today in March of 2023, inflation is at 6.4%. Now let's talk about something real quick. What's gonna happen is uh, Chad and I have talked about this a couple of times, but I really believe what we're gonna get is we're gonna get another bump in inflation. And what that simply means is right now it's coming down because the Fed is raising the interest rates, which slows the economy down. And so the whole idea is because inflation, how many of you have been keeping up with enough to know that inflation has been very difficult for the Fed to tame? So even though you have a lot of economists saying, I wish that Powell would chill out and quit raising rates, the biggest thing they're afraid of is that the economy is gonna get away from them and we're gonna get up to where we were in 1980, which I'll show you. I think I have that graph in here. But in 1980, when, when our regular interest rates at the bank was 17%. How many of you remember that? Are you old enough to remember that? Okay, you remember that. That's what the Fed's afraid of. The Fed is afraid that we're gonna, that we're gonna lose it and it's gonna go up a lot higher. So they continue to raise rates. And is the market, what's the market doing today? Is it up or down? It's down, right? From all the stuff that happened in the banks yesterday and some of the other stuff that happened. So what's going to happen is I, I want to show you inflation. Um, it has a potential. I'm not saying it out automatically is going to, but it's go it has a potential to bump back up above 8%. And, and move up toward 9%. It has that, but it, and so it's a double dip on inflation. The reason I'm showing that to you is that the economy, I believe in the United States of America and in most Western nations and in many developing countries, we, I'm not prophesying this, I'm not believing with you, you can believe against it, but I believe based on the economic indicators, we are going to go into a harder landing recession and it's gonna show up in all aspects including the stock market and real estate. Now I'm gonna give you some graphs to show you why I say that. And uh, let me see if I can, uh, let me see if I can jump over here to this one. This is one I've been showing since last October. So this is October of 2022, uh, excuse me, November of 2022. And I wanna show you this, we're talking about inflation and interest rates. So the yellow line here represents interest rates. The orange line represents a combination of house housing, single family housing, and the stock market. So the stock market in the US and single family housing in the US. And this is 1980 where this big peak that says 14% is, this is interest rates that have continued to come down in nine, from 1980, and this bottom number right here is 2022. And when we edge over in here, we're getting into 2023. We're sitting here right now in the spring of 23. What has happened since interest rates have been coming down for the last 42 years, what's happened with assets, including the stock market and housing, even with some bumps up and down, you can see how high the orange line has gone. What that simply means, I started to say ladies and gentlemen like Big Andrew the other night, but gentlemen, what that actually means is this, is that because we have had 
low, low interest rates, and I want you to hear me now, we have had the lowest interest rates in the history of the United States just in the last several years. I want you to hear me now. The lowest interest rates in history. Yeah, so some of you are younger think, oh man, surely back in 1872, no, the interest rates were higher in 1872. I want you to hear me. Okay, we have been in the lowest interest rate environment uh, since uh, ever in the United States. Secondly, we have had the most dollar bills printed that we have ever had in the history of the United States. That means there's more money, dollars in the economy than we've ever had. So watch this, I got the most money and I have the lowest interest rates that money's got to find somewhere to go. So where does it go? It goes, for example, into assets like the stock market and housing. And the more money you have chasing fewer assets and the money is cheap, it makes the assets go up in price. Everybody understand that? That's this orange line. So what has happened, and I mentioned this last spring, is that we are in a bubble. Now, I got a whole presentation on the history of bubbles here, and I just gave you two of them last year. I got 10 of them up here. I can show you. I'm not going to. I'm just going to show you where we are right now. And, this, and so you can see when interest rates started coming up, what happened to the price of the assets? They started going down. So let me just tell you this, and I'll come back to it. Uh, or maybe if we, do we have microphones uh, that we can share here in a second? I'm gonna couple a couple more, then I'm gonna do some Q&A, is that okay? And let, let them ask whatever they wanna ask. <clears throat> so what, what happens is that when these, you can see these rates going up right here and assets are starting to come down. And so as you look at this, here, here's another graph that'll let you see this. And this is what we call the gross domestic product down here of the United States. That's this line. <coughs> Again, these are asset prices, the same asset prices. This is housing and stock market combined. And you can see that what, what this means when I say gross domestic product, if I was to go around the room today and I was to take uh, the husband and wife income probably across, uh, we could, if we averaged this room or did a median in this room, it would be somewhere between 75 and 100,000 in household income. That's what you would make as a household. Well, this represents the household income of the United States, okay? It's the household income of the United States, but I want you to see that the income hadn't gone up, but the prices, the prices of assets have. And so we see it coming back down because interest rates have gone up. So the reason I'm taking the time to show you this is because when it comes to assets, people ask me, you know, what's going to happen with real estate? Well, I can tell you now, real estate prices are going to get softer no matter what you're hearing because money's going to get tighter. And so people, and right now people are just holding on. They're not selling, but you can't sell forever. You can't wait forever if you get transferred on your job or some, something else happens that where you need to move. And so what's gonna happen is prices in real estate, I think in the next 12 to 18 months are gonna come down 15 to 20%, single family homes. And I'm gonna be buying again, right? And so I'm gonna be buying during that period of time. And I think the same thing's gonna happen with the stock market. I'm gonna show you this, a couple of those graphs in just a second. So just to talk about real estate, I've got a bunch of real estate graphs. I'm almost out of, I got a hurry here. But with real estate, the only saving factor in real estate right now is that the supply of new homes in America has been at the lowest that it's been in in the last 50 years. So if I look at the number of homes built in the United States from 1900 to 2021, these are new homes. I want you to see going all the way back over here, right? I'm going back to 1900. And I start looking at, and you can see as we came back after World War I and World War II, we started seeing some houses built. <clears throat> it's been growing until we get right here. And this is 2010 to 2019. This is after the Great Recession. And you can see we have to go all the way back over here to 1960 and really to 1940 to get below where we were in this past decade. 
So you say, okay, Billy, what does that mean? It means that real estate would come down probably 15%, 20%, but it means because the supply of new housing is not as strong as it's been historically, that that 15 to 20% number in some markets may get mitigated. And instead of being 15 to 20%, it may be 10 to 15%. But at some point, the prices are going to come down. And so I'm showing you here, when you start looking at it, this is the only saving factor right now in the real estate market to keep it from really diving and going down. <clears throat> and so I want you to see that, that graph. Then I'm going to go back to the one I just switched off of, which is this one. So that's housing, inflation, interest rates, and housing. Now here's the stock market. And I want you to see here, this is the S&P 500 ratio against the historical average of the stock market. <clears throat> and so if you look, which I'll, if I have time, I'll come back to the internet bubble, but this is the internet bubble where the market went up so aggressively. How many of you are in here old enough to remember the internet bubble? You remember that? I tried to teach it in business school and 60% of the class wasn't old enough to remember the internet bubble. But I look at, I see plenty of gray hair in here today. So I know you remember the internet bubble. And how many of you remember we had, we had companies that if they were just associated with something on the internet, right? Just associated with it, whether they had any earnings or any money or not, <clears throat> people were investing in them. And we know in two, March of 2000, that internet bubble crashed and came all the way down to where we are right here on the bottom. And then the, this is the stock market, by the way. This is the S&P 500. And it traded sideways. Real estate went up during this season right here. But what happened was when real estate began to crash, the market began to crash. And it actually went below what we call the historical average. And this line right here is the historical average. I want to point that out to you. This is the historical average. So you can see how far up this went, and this is where we are now. Now this era is, is March the 3rd, 2023. What's today, is it March the 10th? Today's March the 10th. So this graph is really right now, March the 3rd, okay? And this is where the, the, the stock market is, is kind of hanging out. I believe that the market is gonna drop here in the next six months to somewhere right in here. Now, why am I telling you that? Because typically the stock market gives us a six month forecast of where it thinks we're gonna be. It's like a thermometer. You put it in your mouth and you see what your temperature is. The stock market will tell us more quickly about the temperature of where the economy is going than anything else we have, including real estate, and I love real estate. But the stock market is a strong indicator of where we're gonna go. And so right now, if for, for this, to, and I'm gonna show you the Buffett indicator in a second, but this is the S&P ratio against the historical average. And always remember that investments, especially the stock market and housing, they'll always come back down to that trend line that they've been on at some point going back historically. So when you see stuff going way out of whack, uh, which if I have time, I'm gonna show you a couple of really good graphs that you can see it real clear. So right now, this is where we are, March the 3rd. Just so everybody's clear, when you were here last year, when you were here last year and I pointed it out, we were about right here. And I told you last year in March, last year that this was gonna fall. Who was here last year? Okay, I told you, your hands raised, and look what's happened. What I'm telling you this year is that it's gonna fall. Ooh, that's a different graph. That's the one I like right there. I'm telling you it's gonna come right here. And then when it comes here, I'm probably gonna invest some money back in it, uh, back in the market when I get down here close to the historical average. Some of you may want to beat it, whatever. Now, this is another one. This is the Buffett indicator, and this is the U.S. stock market value to gross domestic product. Now, the gross domestic product, of course, is just the total value of goods and services that the U.S. produces as a country. So let me point the lines. This is what we call the historical trend line <coughs> of where the market has been. Am I still up there? Can y'all see my cursor? This is where it's been 
this is where it's at as of March the 3rd of this year. And I believe it's going to come down to get about right. Whoop, that's what happened. I keep hitting that deal. Uh, it's coming right here. So I want you to see this. I know I got a few people in here that have math majors or you're an engineer or something, and I don't ever want to sound too technical but I, when I'm doing this, but I do want to just point something out. When you get up here where we were, and I was pointing to you last year, told you we were going to come, come down, there is a, now just, just indulge me for a minute, okay? Just please forgive me. Go ahead and practice forgiveness. But there's such a thing in math and investing called standard deviation. Okay, that's what it's called. And so where we've been in the stock market, just like we were in the internet bubble, we were two standard deviations above the historical average. And, that, and when you get to be two, uh, two, uh, uh, two standard deviations away from the average, you're way out of the ordinary. Remember when teachers used to grade on the bell curve? I had one teacher who did it. Most of the time we didn't believe that in the era I came from. But I had one teacher and uh, uh, I, I think it was calculus and they graded on a bell curve. They were trying to practice this. And so they would, bell curve was where most of the class kind of set and then they adjusted the grades accordingly. Well, what's happening here is this is showing us just the same as the internet bubble. This is called the Buffett Indicator. This is Warren Buffett. This is what he uses to value in his mind the stock market. And what he's saying here is is U.S. stock market compared to the gross domestic product. And so you can see here, this is the internet bubble. This is back where we've just come from. We just were there last March, right? And this is actually after March and it started coming down and this is where we are now. So this is a very strong indicator that this, this line is gonna probably come now. Is there any guarantee? No, there's no guarantee, but that's pretty much where I believe we are. And this is one of the best graphs. If you didn't take a picture of this, this is the one, th this one, this is a great graph, just so you're clear, uh, if, if you don't know that. And this is the Buffett indicator. Actually, this, I pointed where we were, April the 14th, 2022. When was the men's advance? It was March last year, right? So this was April the 14th, we're right here. So this is where we were. I, I think I said we were up here. We were right down here. And it's come up, and now, right, now that is way down here. So it's come up, and it's come down. And so I pointed that to you, that we were gonna go down at least to one standard deviation last year. And here it again, here it is again, just, just showing this part to you uh, going back to last year of 2022. Now, this is uh, the gross domestic product that we've had in the US. And you can see how it's grown, grown. Then you can see how it's gone straight up. And then when I get over to this graph and I'm looking at the stock market going all the way back to 1950, to 1950, just say that with me out loud on purpose, 1950. 1950. Now, the reason I'm doing this is I want you to see how steady the market was, the composite market value. And then how many of you know that in America, we, we now are in what is called a fiat currency? That just means that the note that's printed is basically uh, based on the good faith of the U.S. government. There's no real asset other than the U.S. government backing the currency. Everybody with me? So when we were on either the gold or silver standard, as we go through here, and we began to have similar fiscal money policies that we practice, but as we get forward into modern times, you can see how some of this stuff has just gone ridiculously high. And even today, right in here is where we are right now in the stock market. Now, the stock market should be going up right? There should be a trend line here because the goods and services are becoming more valuable. There's more money being generated, but it's not something that's up here at this big peak. And so I just want everybody in the building to understand we are and have been in a bubble right now and that there is, you need to have a historical perspective. So as you pray, you understand. And I want to take you back to what I'm not sure how everybody was hearing me in the first session, but you're looking for assets. People ask me, Billy, what do I, what do I invest when in when inflation's bad? Well, the first thing you invest in is hard assets that have real value. That's what you do. 
right? You don't, you don't take conjectures out there like crypto that has no real value. You can put fun money in crypto, but real money needs to go into, into hard assets. And you start with hard assets that produce income, i.e. real estate, right? Or I will call a business that has real assets in the business and is producing good cash flow. I'll take the capital distributions out of that business. I call that can be a hard, it's not a true hard asset, but it's a good asset. Then I can go to stuff like dividend paying stocks, dividend paying stocks. Those are like consumer staple stocks and other kinds of stocks that are actually paying me. How many of you understand a dividend on a stock actually pays you whether it goes up or down in value? As long as the company declares a dividend, you get the dividend off the number of shares that you own not just off the price. So you have to understand things that you need to be investing in things like, for example, oil and gas, right? That's a hard asset, any kind of commodity. Now, I like gold and silver right now during inflationary times, but gold and silver is my defensive investment because I don't make any money off of gold and silver unless I sell it. I like stuff that's paying me monthly, quarterly, or annually. Right, But gold and silver are good asset to hold in during inflationary times. So I just want you to see where we've been. Is everybody okay? Am I hurting anybody? Oh, I see y'all squirming. Okay. Now, I want you to see this. Here's another, another graph, and then I, we're gonna... Uh, how many of you like to do questions and answers? If you don't, I got a ton of stuff. Anybody wanna do Q&A or y'all good? Anybody got questions? You like them? Okay, obviously get a bunch of thumbs up. Okay. So this, this, these red bars are what we call the federal funds rate. So this is what the Fed going back to 19, what does that say? 1980. Going back to, is that right? 1980. What it, and it shows you, and I want, how many of you see this 0% interest right here? Can you see that? How many of you see 0% interest right here? See that? Now look what happened to the trend line of assets and the stock market, right? This is actually the S&P 500, this blue line. Look what happened as it goes up when these interest rates are nothing. You see that? And interest rates start coming up. What happened to the stock market? Watch this. Here's interest rates coming up. What happened to the market? It went down. And so I want you to understand, have a perspective of what we're actually, what kind of historical environment that we're in. Now look, guys, born again, tongue-talking believers, okay? You gotta be like the sons of Issachar. The greatest wealth transfers come in times like this. You had to position yourself on the right side, the correct side, position yourself so it happens. But right now, as the economy gets ready to slow down, what'll happen is the economy will slow down for a period of time. You position yourself and it's gonna start coming back up. I'll give you an example. Real estate's gonna go down. What do you do? That's the right time to start buying and looking. The stock market's gonna go down. Well, unless you're shorting the market, which some people are, a lot of people are actually, not just some, are shorting the market right now. However, the market's gonna come down down and you can then, as it gets down a little lower, it's a good time to be able to invest. And so the reason that I'm sharing this with you is you have to have a perspective that history will repeat itself and this stuff does not happen just accidentally. There's factors that contribute to it in order to understand how to do that. Everybody good? Everybody with me? So as I show you these, instead of, I got a bunch more graphs, I got a ton of graphs, but instead of showing you more graphs, let's take a minute. I've got about 10 minutes. Let's take a couple of minutes and do some questions and answers. You can ask me any question on the economy or investing that you want to ask uh, or business or anything like that, finances and money. And so if you have a question, raise your hand. They'll try to get to you with a mic. And then we got one over here. We've got a couple back there over here. Okay. Okay. So if you get the microphone, go ahead and stand and then ask your question. So I've got a two-part question. First off, is, is, it, is it a good policy to when you have residential uh, real estate to, let's say you buy a house, you get it for 40 cents on a dollar, you, you, you build it up, you make it rentable, you rent it, after a year you build equity in it to take the equity out of that house and purchase other real estate. Absolutely, that's how wealth is built. Okay. Right, I call, I call that the law of acceleration. I'll, I'll go ahead. And then my second question is, I currently have a commercial property that is owner finance. So okay. I have no, I have no you know, leverage against 
borrowing the equity out of that because they're not going to obviously loan me the equity. Should I refinance that commercial property to recognize the equity or should I just keep it and pay it off? So what's your, what is the equity ratio you have? Um, what's your uh, loan to value? So I owe about 700,000. It's probably equitied out at 1.4. Uh, what, what's the interest rate you're paying them? Right now with the, uh, with the owner, 5%. How much? 5%. Yeah, so you, uh, I don't think you're going to beat that okay. right now based on that market. What kind of income is coming off the property? Um, I'm getting about half of, I mean, because I, I use half of that property. Okay. So I'm getting about half of the lease payment. You get about revenue, half of what you're paying From revenue from other properties in the front. You're yeah. actually in pretty good shape. Okay, so just leave at five percent. Like That's yeah. You're in good position. I knew I wasn't going to get the percentage rate from a bank, but I was just I was considering the equity part. So. Well, let me explain something. If you had it leased, if you had it leased, and you had fairly strong tenants in there, financial tenants, then you might be able to negotiate something because you're at a fifty percent loan to value. You might be able to negotiate something down on that interest rate down in the fours with a bank. Right now, banks on that kind of stuff are are six, seven, eight. You know, a lot of them are about 8% right now and that kind of stuff. And that's if you're a really good customer, you know, with, with good. Some of them are at seven. I know some loans right now with guys I know, commercial, that actually recently have got rates of actually less than 30-year mortgages on their commercial buildings. But it just depends on the quality of your income on that building based on the rate you're going to get. That's a great question, though, by the way. All right, somebody else. I know we have some other hands. Yes, sir. Okay, a lot of people are well, thinking that they will, uh, there will be a financial collapse. Uh -huh. What do you think about that, and if so, when? And also, um, what do you think the best um, investments or um, uh, preparation would be for that? I'm thinking maybe food, uh, gold, silver, but uh, what, do you, what do you say? Yeah, I think gold and silver is your best. I don't, I don't, I'm not convinced that we're, you know, it's gonna be that hard or we're gonna, we're going to actually crash, crash. I know uh, one, one, of the, one of my friends, we call each other cousin. He's talking about some of that now on some of his podcasts. And we usually get on there once or twice a month with him. Uh, and uh, Lance Wall now. And, but my, what, what I believe we're going to do is take that, you know, 15, 20% hit. And, but those are good times. It's like the spring, summer, right? Spring, summer, fall, and winter. There may be a short winter time that we go through, but that's a good time to get prepared. And in those really kind of really drastic economic uh, conditions, let me just be very candid, gold, silver, and cash, right? Even cash, even though cash is fiat, right now, U.S. cash is still worth some money. So in these kind of, in these kind of environments, uh, you know, if somebody wants to really know, we call it the permanent portfolio. You got 25, 25% of what you got is cash, 25% is in gold. <clears throat> and then if you really want to have some upside exposure, you may put 25% in some kind of stocks and 25% in short-term bonds. But that's just what we would call a portfolio that would just kind of sit. Right now, I don't have that portfolio allocation myself. And so uh, I'm a little more conservative than that right now, even with that. So just so you know. All right, I got another, where am I at? Right here. Uh, where do you see rents going if you see the market going down? And then the second part, if interest rates are going up but prices are coming down, uh, it's essentially like if you're gonna mortgage a new property, it's essentially the same if the prices are low but the mortgage rates are high. So uh, do you see while prices are down something happening where the Fed drops the mortgage rate so then you can then we can jump in? Or? Yeah, I think the rates will go up. I think your mortgage rates are gonna go up. The feds let us know that they're gonna be in it for the long haul. So your interest rates, which means your 30 year normal owner occupant rates are gonna get, I think they're gonna to get to 9%, my opinion. What will happen is when they do that, then property prices will come down. It's a great time to buy. But then I think what'll happen is then the fed will start easing we're talking U.S. now, but other countries will represent this. The Fed will start easing. Interest rates will start ticking back down, probably get down to 6%, and that's a really good time to start buying. I would buy now and refi at the 6%. Not, not today, but when rates get real high and, and real estate comes down, I would buy 
In my case, I've been buy, paying cash for the last 20, however many years, so I haven't done loans. I'm actually gonna borrow some money when that happens and buy some real estate and then refinance it. I'll do something like a 50% loan to value when I invest, but it'll still be more than I've done in a long time. I don't like to be, in, in my age in life, I don't like to be above 50% leveraged. I don't like that, so I stay around 50%. But if you're young, you could get up to 80% leverage in those houses and still do pretty good and then refine. Let me say this about rents. This is, this is worth the price of the whole men's retreat. Okay, if you have real estate. If you don't have real estate and you're not renting, then it wouldn't apply. But if it does, rents are gonna continue to tick up because here's what's gonna happen. With rates go up, people are gonna have less ability to own their own house, so they have to rent. Because always remember this, people have to have a place to live. So the only time that rents have ever really gone down in history is when we get in a deflationary period and if you check them out, rents do not go down equally with the price of housing. Matter of fact, when we went through the Great, uh, through the great Recession in 2007, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, if you follow rents in that time, you'd be surprised in some markets how strong the trend line was for rents going up because people who could no longer afford to live in their own house had to have a place to live. And so even right in the middle of hard economic times, rents were actually ticking up through that period. So right now, as we're looking, including what I'm forecasting to you here publicly, rents are gonna continue to tick up. That's where we're headed. There may be a few isolated markets, pockets, where that, they may even out, but for the most part, people, people need a place to live and they'll continue to go up. So, you know, let me say this real quick before I take another one. Um, on what you said about the, the rental housing and you talked about, can I take my equity? I always call that the law of acceleration because let's say if you put $10,000 down on a $100,000 property, right? For example, <clears throat> if you can refi, take that 10,000 back out, you, then you go and apply it on another property and it's the same bag of money, right? Same bag of money. So you take the same $10,000 and if you do it right, you can say acquire 10 properties and you're doing it with the same money because your houses go up, you're able to take it out. So I call that the law of acceleration. You're able to acquire, now you gotta be smarter. You gotta be more financially literate to be able to do something like that so that you're able to make money. But that's exactly how I started many, 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 many years ago when I started investing in real estate was doing that very same principle and that's how I built what I had in those days. That's how I did that. Amen. All right, somebody else. Where am I? Right here? Okay. Yep. So um, my wife and I have three single family properties. Congratulations. And we haven't, thank you. We haven't sat down with anybody to find out, one, can you take a HELOC out on a rental property mm -hmm. to purchase more property? Mm -hmm. And the second one is, do you happen to have a resource for, just like Tricord in other countries, mm -hmm. do you have a hard money person, people, a bank, someone kingdom that you would recommend for future purchases. If, you, if you'll that. write, if you'll write the office, my office, it's at wealthbuilders.org, and you can, you can send it to Billy at I think it's Billy at wealthbuilders.org, or you can uh, just I think you can go to info at wealthbuilders.org, something like that, and you can send an email, and we'll find out where you're located and see who we know in those areas kind of help. You cannot do a HELOC on true investment property. So always, now we're talking mortgage products. When you, when you talk about HELOC, it's not a true mortgage, but it's a home equity line of credit for those that don't know. So home equity line of credits are made for those uh, type of properties that are considered owner occupant. They're not investor properties. Now what you can do with investor properties is you can either do a second mortgage, right? Unless you're in the state of Texas. And actually there, there some of that has changed recently. But you actually uh, would either refi the property altogether, which I wouldn't do now, or you can do a second mortgage on the rest, on whatever portion of equity up to about 80% uh, loan to value on that property. So if the property's worth 100,000, then you probably could get up to an $80,000 loan. So whatever, whatever your first mortgage is on that, you can either get a brand new first mortgage, but right now the problem with that, your rates are high. So what I suggest you do is do a smaller amount, like a second mortgage, it's not a true HELOC. Now, if you have your own home and it's an owner-occupant home, then HELOCs right now are the cheapest money in the market. You go get a HELOC, you don't, first of all, you don't, you're not paying on the whole amount, you just got that loan sitting there you can use and you're not paying on it if you don't borrow on it. 
However, it's still, it's still the lowest interest rate uh, product in the market right now. And, and they want to do them. Believe me, banks want to do HELOCs. They, they want to do them. So uh, if you've got any kind of regular W-2 income or good, strong 1099 income, they'll do a HELOC all day long with you. So that's what I would do. I would look at, but that's owner, only owner occupant, not, not in the uh, investment side. You'll have to do mortgages first or second. All right, anybody else? What I got? We're right here, I got one back here first. Okay, I got one over there. All right, go ahead. So I'm wondering about self-directed Roth IRAs. Mm -hmm. Do you work with investors that utilize those? And do you Absolutely. bring those folks together? So you have recommendations on folks to keep the cost down when they establish their LLC for yeah. investments? Yeah, so what we teach in Wealth Builders on that is we, the, one of the guys that's one of our coaches and attorneys, his name is Bill Bronchek. And what we do is we, we take, if you have a Roth, it doesn't matter if it's a Roth IRA or if it's an IRA. In either case, uh, you never, I'm gonna give you something for you that this applies to. Again, it's worth the price of the trip you came out here. And here it is. You never, never wanna invest in real estate directly from an IRA. So if I'm talking 401k, 403b, 457a, or if I roll over to a true 401k, you're with a company, you wanna be able to roll out of those, go through a rollover IRA and into a self-directed IRA. So it can be a self-directed Roth IRA, that's what you have, and you can roll over into that and then you do not wanna invest directly in a piece of real estate from that self-directed you want to invest in your real estate company that buys that piece of property because then the rules that apply are much more loose than if you do that directly through your IRA into a property. So you want to go from, you want to roll over, get over here in the self-directed, and then from the self-directed, you would go into your LLC company, your real estate company is an LLC that then buys the real estate. So that's, the, and then there's a whole bunch of stuff that goes with it. We talk about it. I think it's in my book. I think it's in the real estate mastery book, but I think it's, I know it's in the program that we have out there. And we talk about how you do that and why, you know, what the benefits are. And I think Broncheck is on that product as well, talking about it. I have to go back and look. I'm not sure which one is back there. All right. I had somebody else. Okay. Then I think this gentleman right here, then I'll come over here. Okay. Everybody doing Okay. Okay. Hold on now. Let's get a microphone. We got these young guys running. They can move. Uh, your thoughts on a reverse mortgage for an old guy like me who owns his home free and clear? Well, I, you know, if you need the money, I'm okay with it. Uh, reverse mortgages are not, if you look at the return on money and the cost of them, they're not the best investment out there. Uh, however, if you need money, for example, people need money to live, then that, that product is there to help you. So I am not anti reverse mortgage if you need the capital. But if you run the numbers on reverse mortgages, uh, the people that are issuing them are making a pretty good return. Uh, at least the ones I've reviewed and looked at, they're making really good return on that. Matter of fact, I've thought about getting in it, but I didn't, I didn't, I don't like taking advantage of people. Okay, yes, sir. What about the oil industry, oil companies? I heavily invested in uh, oil stock eight years ago and okay. it's gone way down. What do you predict about it? And what's the future for the oil companies, especially offshore drilling rigs? Well, I think, I think uh, what I call direct investing in oil right now has been reasonably good. And oil stocks, uh, uh, you know, not going back eight years, but in recent times, oil stocks, because oil is really a commodity. So anytime we're in inflationary periods like we are, right, so, so let me just say this without sounding like I'm digressing. Oil is something that we use and oil is something that has what I call intrinsic value. Because it has intrinsic value and it's a commodity, of course, because of that right now, those kinds of, especially direct investments, if you get in with good deals, and I'm assuming you're talking about direct, investing directly in rigs. Is that what you're talking about? Some of those direct, in those rigged investments, depending on how the investment is structured, but for some of those investments, do y'all realize that you get an 85% write-off in the first year on a direct wellhead investment? Y'all looking at me like a calf at a new gate. So if you put 100 grand in it, 
You get to write off 85,000 85, against your income. So it's a great protection against your taxes. And so my point is uh, right now, depending on the structure of the investment, I'd have to look at the structure. But as far as making the investment right now, we have a deal, and Chad does with, with uh, we, we call, it's called Wildlife Partners, and it invests in exotic animals. And it, the first, so if you invest 100 grand, you get something anywhere from like an 82 to a 91% write off, depending on what you do with it. You get that in the first year, plus you get the return. And believe me, wild, wild uh, exotic animals are definitely not correlated to the stock market, just so you're clear. And so if you want something that is a hard asset that's not correlated to the stock market, that's a good one. But I like oil right now. Now, I mean, it's gotta be the right investment. It's gotta be structured right. But I still, I like that as an alternative investment in inflationary times because commodities are gonna be solid right now. It's a good question. All right, anybody else? Okay, I got one here, one there. Y'all help me. Okay, I got a couple of you back there. Okay, over here. Yes, sir. So in regards to investing in uh, residential properties, would it be better to build a new home, buy an already existing, or does it matter? Well, right now, I think, depending on what part of the country you're in, used to be where we're sitting right now in Woodland Park, four or five years ago, you could build a house for cheaper than you could buy one. Now it's reversed, and it costs more to build. Uh, and actually, it's coming back again, but we, we reversed, and it costs more to actually uh, build a house than it is to buy one. And th they kind of go in cycles. However, in some parts of the country right now, where are you from? Wyoming. Wyoming. So in Wyoming, it might be the case. You might could build cheaper than you can actually buy because I don't think there's a lot of inventory up there. And so, uh, and, and some of the builders are now waking up to these high interest rates to these high interest rates. And so because of that, uh, some of those prices on construction are coming down. You just, you just compare. How much does it cost to build per square foot? How much does it cost to buy per square foot? And what are you getting in that price? And that's how you know. That's how I determine. Okay, help me. Point to me. All right. Yeah, um, I recently came across um, indexed universal life policies mm -hmm. and and been reading a little bit about them as a mechanism to support generational wealth building. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion on, on those strategies? On uh, investing in universal life? Is that what you're asking? Well, so like index universal life allows for mm -hmm. an indexed yeah. uh, investment strategy um, as well as cash value and death benefit. Well, first of all, if you need life insurance, which you look pretty young, so you probably do. Uh, so, you know, ha having life insurance, if you're married, especially and have a family, it's not a bad idea. And then secondly, I think for a long-term strategy, investing, you know, universal life, and you're able to take, they'll take the difference of some of your premiums and go ahead and invest them in something like a S&P 500 index fund. That's why they call it indexing. And there's other kinds of index funds that are out there. But uh, I think it's a good long-term strategy. It doesn't meet that, that uh, in the beginning anyway, it doesn't meet the uh, monthly, quarterly, or annual income that I like to see you focus on. But for long-term planning, it's a good idea. So those kind of, especially if you're young and you're patient, you can do it. But I really want, I really want those of you that are younger to focus on that second X strategy uh, for kingdom purposes. But that's still a good strategy long-term. All right, point, somebody raise your hand so I see you. My, microphone people, where are you? Okay, over here. Uh, what about investing in the bond market at this point? Uh, well, okay, I'm going to go ahead and go there. So <laughs> the yield curve in bonds right now is what we call inverted. And so what that really means, if you look, the short-term bond, like a two-year treasury bond, even a three-month treasury bond. You know what that is today, Chad? What's, it? What's a three-month because uh, I'm going to show you something here. Give me a second. Be patient for a second. What's a three-year bond today paying? I mean, three-month bond. Okay, so watch this, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, gentlemen, sorry. <laughs> watch this. The three-month bond is paying 4.95. Ooh, so it's paying 5%, okay? So the three, and that's a three-month, right? Three months. Really? 
That's pretty good. Okay, so t- tell me what the 10 year bond's paying today. Watch this, I'm gonna teach you this finance class. You ready? 3.7. Yeah, so your 10 year bond is paying 3.7. I can't believe this one. And your, your three month bond is paying 5%. We call that an inverted yield curve. And what that simply means is short term bonds should never pay more than long term bonds. And if we talk about the number one reason recession is that we're headed for a recession is that how many, Chad, we've had 11 or 12 of these where we had the inverted yield curve historically in the U.S. And every time we have had a recession that has followed an inverted yield curve, it just inverted yield curve just simply means when a short-term bond to keep it simple, it means that when a short-term bond is paying more than a long-term treasury, they're all the same, they're all U.S. treasuries, and it's paying more, it's called an inverted yield curve, and recession, the last 11 we've had, have always, we've had recession follow the last 11 inverted yield curves we've had. That's a serious inversion. 4.5% to 3 point, three point seven. wow. So short-term bonds right now are a really good investment. Long-term bonds are not a good investment. So that's one of the things. So that's when I said a while ago when I was giving you the what I call the permanent portfolio, Harry Brown permanent portfolio, and I do mine a little different, but that's what I was talking about on bonds. It has to be short-term bonds. It has to be in this environment. It has to be short-term bonds. It can't be long-term bonds. So I don't know if everybody understood what I just said. So if, you, if you're not sure about it, just remember it's not good. <laughs> just so you know. Okay, microphone folk, where are you? Okay, in the back, okay. Man, it's hard seeing in here with that. Go ahead. Sorry, one more question here. Um, so since your talk, talk last year, I went from one house to now I have three uh, just trying to implement your strategies. But one thing I was surprised about is last year you were talking about saving on taxes because of all the tax advantages of real estate. Mm-hmm. But my uh, CPA advised me that I can only take advantage of 25,000 of that yeah. because of the, the mom and pop rule. So do you have any strategies for someone who, like I'm using a property manager to take care of my properties. How can I take advantage of more taxes or strategies you know, above that mom and pop rule. Okay, so what I'm gonna tell you is worth three years of CARES tuition. <laughs> okay? So in order to get the, what we call a full-time basis in your, in your properties, you have to have, you have to become a real estate professional, not a real estate agent. Even though a real estate agent qualifies in most instances as a real estate professional. However, uh, as a real estate professional, what you do is you take a couple approaches. Either you flip a few houses in the process year and you take, you take earned income from those flips. You understand what I'm saying when I say that? That means you're, you're buying a house, you're flipping it in 90 days, you're taking the profit out of it in less than 12 months, okay? And you're doing that a couple of times. Then in your buy and hold properties, you will, you will, you will get what's called a full-time basis in your properties that you're buying and holding. So the front end, you're buying and flipping, which means you're active in the real estate business, right? And you have to have that 750 hours of participation in it to be able to get it, and you end up getting a full-time basis. So, or there's a bunch of ways you can do it to get the real estate professional designation. I think I give you about 15 of those in one of those products that you can do to be able to get what's called. So then you get a full-time participation in your properties and you get a full write-off on your depreciation. You get a full write-off on your expenses. And, and if you don't take them all in one year, they continue to roll over. But the normal retail investor, the most you're ever gonna get is a $25,000 write-off in one year. And that's if you're at 100,000 a year or lower. I think as a couple, it's like a, a hundred. And thirty thousand or something like that, one hundred forty-seven thousand now I think. So uh, in order to get it, so you wanna you wanna create on the front end of your real estate business having active participation, and on the and your your CPA should tell you that. Just just so we're clear, they should help you understand how you get a real and a lot of you know very candidly, not every CPA knows about it. 
They don't know how the real estate professional designation works unless they have other real estate investor clients. But for years on my taxes, going back many years, I've had that real estate professional designation in one year, true story. One year I had a true million dollars that I had in primarily passive income that year. Primarily, and it wasn't from buying and selling property. It was just some things that happened that, that I had good income that year. I've had several years with good income. And my, my write-offs had been rolling over every year. So I just sheltered the, end time, the, the entire amount of income that I had coming in that year. I didn't have to do what's called a 1031 exchange or anything. I had enough rollover losses to cover it all and then took a couple hundred thousand into the next year. So you just have to get there. In, but it's really, it's, you, you can do it quicker. You can do it in one year now. If you just get active in your real estate business, you, you can buy and flip, even if you're active in doing tax liens or if you're an active real estate agent or you can even be active in teaching real estate. All of that counts toward uh, your ability to be able to have a full-time participation in your properties and get the 100% the right, the write-off, so to speak. You get a full basis in your property. If you understood what I just said, that's worth the price of the ticket. Okay? All right. Where am I at? Right here? Yes, sir. Okay. Um, what is the smartest way to buy the first home? Um, what is the, maybe this, the smartest way to, to start investing in the kingdom? Yeah, you're going to have to help me with the first part. Say that again. I'm sorry. Uh, the smartest way to buy the first home. Your first home? Yep. Yeah, you, your, your smartest way is just make sure you have some down payment money. Make sure your credit score is at, at least 680. You can do it at 620. Uh, you can do it at 580 with FHA, but you, if you really want to be good, be, get your credit score at 680. 680. Have at least, uh, if you're a first home buyer, you can do it for as little as 3 to 5% down with FHA as well. And uh, you can do it down to a 620 credit score. So have 3 to 5% down. I prefer to see you do 10% on your first home, and then uh, make sure you have a, a, a credit score that's above 620, preferably at 680. If you're gonna be a full-time real estate investor, I like to see you try to maintain that at 760. If you're gonna use mortgage money to buy, if you're gonna use bank money, you don't need a credit score that strong if they know you. So, But your first home, that, that's what you need to do. And then, honestly, I always tell young people, go ahead and start buying your first house, right? Open a Roth IRA, IRA start investing, And, uh, and put money aside to start building some green dots. And then uh, my opinion is the quickest way to build wealth in America right now besides your own business is real estate. So period. And it's the quickest way unless you inherit or you're royalty or something. So just being, that's a good question. All right, no, I saw some more hands, but I realized we're out of time. I didn't know that. And I apologize. I think, my, I didn't know that, Michael. I thought we were supposed to quit at what time? Three o'clock? Yep, sorry, I gave you bonus of 19 minutes. You don't go anywhere because I'm gonna pass off from Bucket for that 19 minutes. No, I'm kidding. Hey, thank you guys. Y'all been an awesome audience. Mark, why don't you come back? Hey, 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 I want to give away this book. Can I, this is a book, this is my favorite books of all my books called Change Mastery. It, it has literally, this is my testimony of what I had to go through in my own life. Anytime God wants to give you new wine, you've got to give to God a new wine skin. So do I have anybody in here 85 and up? 85 and up? Huh? 85, here, give that to them. 85 and up. God bless y'all. <laughs>